Okay, so this video is the second video in the Knight Rider series. We're starting from the point where we left off on the last video. And in the last video, we had a, you know, a, a start to the animation. It's really not finished. You can see it quickly um, starting to not do uh, what it's supposed to do. I'm going to slow it right down. We do have an LED that lights up here. And... Um, Sorry, I'm just going to change this here. So we have an LED that lights up initially. A, a LED that lights up and then moves to this position. This one's faded out, you'll notice, then moves to this pos position. This one's faded out and this one's off. And that's all it does to get started. That's the beginning of the animation idea. And the way this is been done is, uh, you know, the fading out effect in particular um, is using uh, the PWM pins, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And the, the kind of programming approach has been a very simple one of simply of turning on the LED, delaying for a short period of time, and then going to the next step and setting up which LEDs need to be on in this case this LED is on fully and because of the analog right this one's on somewhat faded and delaying again and then going to the next step and you'll notice turning this one on fully turning this one on faded and of course turning off the original one the leftmost LED turning that off completely and delaying it's not finished at this point we should you know need to do one two three four five six seven seven more steps to seven more blocks just like this to accomplish this going back and forth and that's a lot of code and the question might be how we could do that more effectively in a more programmatic uh, way and the other thing before we look at that the other thing I just would like to point out is that our pin numbers you can see them up here three five six nine ten eleven seems like kind of an odd set of numbers why didn't we just go sequentially you know we we could do this this step here a lot more easily if we had simply picked numbers that were in sequence we could have you know set up some digital rights here using a variable and start at the variable equaling three then a moment later after the delay we could have incremented that three say turn that to a four we could light up four at full brightness we could light up the previous one so whatever the variable equals minus one at like a very minimal amount and light up the one you know pr uh, uh, prior to that we could uh, or or in the next step I, I guess we could increment that variable light this up fully light this up you know uh, partially light and turn this one off completely we could work those details out but of course the reason we haven't or aren't able to do that is because we're trying to make use of this fading feature of pulse width modulation and the pins that are enabled with pulse width modulation on the UNO at least in, in, in our uh, example on Tinkercad and it would be similar in, in other Arduinos I think most of them at least we don't have access to a series of pins that are all sequentially numbered that have the PWM enabled. It's, it skips sometimes, sometimes it doesn't. It's just however the hardware dictated what, which, where these connections were made dictates where these PWMs are available and it's not in a sequential order. So we want to really deal with that and see if we can get some way of organizing them sequentially so we can at least start trying to rough out that idea of uh, working through uh, using some kind of control variable to manage which pin we're on. And really the answer to that is going to be uh, to use an array. We're going to use an array and we'll talk about it briefly. I, I, I do mean to make a video just on arrays and on for loops for the uh, programming in C playlist that can go a little more in depth. But we'll try to cover it quickly from the, from the beginning in this video as well. And we'll just uh, get started on that. So I've in another project here, I've just copied these pin numbers here can see this is already here but uh, I've copied these pin numbers these are the pin numbers that we need to deal with in order in the order that they're appearing here in the order that they're hooked up onto the Arduino 
and we're going to put them in an, in this uh, you know it's, I don't know how to best explain it uh, to to uh, to students who have not encountered sorry not encountered uh, an array before I, I do know that many people explain it as a filing cabinet so if you imagine these numbers being placed in, into some kind of filing cabinet where you know this is the first uh, this is the first file, the first drawer in the filing cabinet, and this is the second, and this is the third. You have access to multiple things, even though these are all, you know, normally in a, in a variable, you can only store one value. Let me just say that to begin with. You can only store one value, and you would be hard pressed to be able to store multiple values in, 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 in any single variable, a variable that you create that is an integer, for instance, is only capable of storing a three. And if you try to store a five in there as well, you replace the value that was there previously. The array is like multiple integers organized by the filing cabinet number. And you can kind of access that, uh, the, uh, the variable, the value, by the number that uh, it's stored in. The only kind of trick is that, of course, being computer, folks, uh, the numbering starts at zero. So this is called zero indexed. And it's, you know, most languages will do this, not all languages, but many of them will start ordering their values beginning with the uh, index at zero. So if we were able to create one of these arrays, we could then access the first value by using the value drawer number zero to access this value three and number one would get us the uh, value stored in uh, the number one drawer which was uh, five and these numbers up here are called index uh, the index or indices I guess plural but the index uh, number so uh, we're able to use an index and that will uh, get us the value that's stored in the array in that position now when we create an array in C, we have to tell it uh, at the beginning how many indexes, how many, how many values we're going to be able to store in that array. So you can see in this case we have six here. So we will uh, want to say that. Now the way I'm going to create the array is I'm going to kind of pre-populate it with these values. So you know if you want to uh, look at some of the options you have for doing this, the Arduino reference, of course, is a great starting point. And you can see here that there's some very various kind of uh, uh, examples of how to uh, de declare or create the array. And I'm using this second example here. This example here creates the array of uh, six items, but it doesn't store any values in it yet. So if you were to go and try to access those values, you really don't know what you would get. You might get, uh, you might have, if your code was running earlier storing information, perhaps you have some old information that might have been not cleared out of the memory and uh, I'm not entirely sure of that, but you, you won't be able to trust those values until you actually set them. And because of our example, we really want to set those to pins just like they're doing, I think, in this example. So we're going to follow this this uh, form here. So, you know, I usually, I would suggest you copy and paste that into your code and uh, and start working with it. I actually called it the LED pins in, uh, or that was going to be my name, so I, I will change that to LED pins. And I will change these values in here to the values I wanted. Which are 3, 5, 6, 9, 10, and 11. And those are my six values. And you'll notice a couple of things. First of all, we are declaring the type here. So this is going to contain integers, and it's only going to, to contain integers. You cannot mix integers and floats or whatever other, other idea you might have. If you're coming from uh, having worked with lists in Python, this is different. I don't think it's particularly good form to mix things together in Python anyways. It's, uh, you know, in most cases, a list in Python really should have a uniform type, but, it, but you're not bound to that. But I, in this, in, in C, you must state the type, of course, 
and you are uh, and you must have the same type throughout the list and and I'm mentioning Python because in certainly in my classroom many of the students are have been exposed to Python already the other difference you might notice is that um, in a list in Python you're able to add more elements uh, as you go along if you wish and in this uh, and in C we we set this size we've set the size here by only having six values in this declaration we have set the size of this array to six and we cannot change that going forward so there is no ability to append to this list uh, array excuse me there's no ability to do that this is the size of the list and the uh, array and that's going to be and that's set now so what this means is if I wanted to find out what the value at LED, uh, if I wanted to find out what the first value in my array is I would use these square brackets sorry that's the other thing I want to mention about this uh, declaration is that we have the square brackets here so you know multiple kinds of brackets here there's square brackets uh, there are parentheses above the 9 and the 0 and there are curly braces and they all mean different things so we really want to be we, we you know want to recognize them and understand what they, their meanings are and uh, I, I would kind of say that square brackets are are usually indicating the idea of an array or an index um, and so what later on in our code if we want to access this value we just place that index which in this case is the first one so it's a zero we place that in the square brackets and that will get us that value if we want the last value uh, we would place the index which is the last index which in this case is five when there's six items in the array because we start counting at zero the last index is always one less than the length of the array the number of items in an in an array is called its length okay so all of that is to say that we can create this let's create up here a global scope so we have access to it wherever we need to both within setup and within the main loop and get rid of all this and I will replace this set of pin modes here I'll just grab one of them and I'll replace it using a for loop so for loop is a really great way to be able to run through a, a, a series of something to perform an operation um, re, you know repetitively uh, and to also manipulate a variable uh, in the process if we need to and so let's say I wanted to do this pin mode let's just say I wanted to do it six times to begin with so I need to put in some kind of you know this almost feels like an if statement and in a way it's got a similar concept in that there's uh, a need for some conditions in here so we're going to put in some conditions these are going to I, I'm going to call these start stop and step because that's what we've uh, called them in the past in Python and so uh, I want to know what the starting condition is when I'm going to stop and what this the uh, incrementing uh, condition is as well so my my uh, I'm going to use the variable I for index and I'm going to I'm going to start it at zero so our start condition here is to start it at zero and uh, um, so I have a variable i that is available inside this loop. Now I want to be careful about trying to reuse this i outside of the loop. That's not this i is intended for this loop and really for this loop only. So I'm going to create a variable here at this kind of uh, for loop step, and I'm going to use it inside of my loop. I'm going I'm going to use it to do work for me. I'm actually not going to mess with the value inside of the loop. I'm not going to try to manipulate or change or assign anything to i inside of the loop. This is all going to be done manipulating this i variable. It's all going to be done for me by the for loop. So here it is, starting at value i. Now I want it to run five times. Or excuse me, I want it to run six times. I want this for loop to do all these pin modes. So I want six operations to occur. And so I'm going to use this uh, uh, syntax, which is simply, you know, i is less than six. That means this is going to run 
for the the indexes <laughs> the index is uh, six of them zero one two three uh, all the way up to five and not including six you know six is not less than six so we'll see in a moment that's going to be the end point and each time I want this loop to um, increment by one so the way this the way this is going to work is that it's going to run this code and I can I can show we can look at what's happening here with I by printing it out so I'm just going to put a monster well it doesn't really matter I don't think I've got a print in here so let's just run this code and see these values come out for I and uh, because I'm printing them here and we'll just look down at the serial monitor um, I'm mixing in Python syntax Okay, so if we look down here, we've run through our for loop and we see the values being printed out. They start with the value i, so the for loop starts, it initializes i with the value 0. It runs the pin, it's going to run some code inside of this for loop and for now really all we care about I guess is this print statement. So it prints out the value of i which was 0 finishes whatever code is in this block and comes back here. This, at this point, this step command kind of uh, takes place. So we increment this by 1. So i becomes 1 more than its previous value, which in this case would be 1. And we check the condition. Is i currently less than 6? Sorry, I should have said that initially, too. It's probably checking the condition right off the bat. It is checking the condition right off the bat. 0 was less than 6, so this condition is checked and it runs the code. It, increments it to a value 1. 1 is less than 6, so it runs the code. It increments it again to value 2. 2 is less than 6. It continues to run the code. It keeps going until it runs for the value of uh, 5. So when it increments 4, it's 5, which is less than 6, so it runs the code. And you can imagine what happens next. 5 gets incremented to 6. 6 is no longer less than 6. And so this condition at that point is false. And it stops running this block of code and continues on from line 14. It continues on with the next uh, you know, valid line of code uh, following that. So let me just make one small change. We can replace this i with this increment operator. So it's kind of a short form to say i equals i plus 1. So how do we make this do some useful work for us? Well, why don't we look at what's going on inside of our fancy new array using this i. So let's look at LED pins at index i as well and see what that looks like. So I'll just run that. We've got definitely got a few more numbers coming out. And oops, what do those numbers look like? I'll just scroll up to the oh right. So I'll clear that and run it. And let's look at what we have now. So the original index that we printed here at line 11 was 0. The next value that we got from LED pins was the value at index 0, which turns out to be the first value. So printed out a 3. Then we incremented i to 1, and it printed out the value at index 1, which is the 5. You can see what's happening here. We're looping through, and we've printed out, we've you know been able to access each value in turn from our LED pins array. So what we really want to do is set all of those pins to outputs. And so we can stick that in here now. And when we run this code, now we've printed all these things out, but we've also successfully set all of these pins to output mode. And this is really useful. You know, this is going to give us even more options as we move down into the main loop here, where we need to figure out a way to try to light these up sequentially. So you could imagine that we would do this exact same thing but do our analog writes. So you can see I've already worked on some of these ideas so let's just try to do this from the beginning as well. So we'll just take this code here and I'll just get rid of 
uh, I'll just get rid of everything else, I guess, and see what we can do. So you have to be careful of your braces at this point, otherwise it's going to get really confusing. So the four loops close with a brace. And I really wish, you know, if you run into problems with your braces, I strongly recommend you download the full version of Arduino with the proper, with the real Arduino editor, because when you click on a brace, the Arduino editor will highlight the brace that it uh, matches up with and it's not a problem right now we've only got two levels of braces at this point and I'm trying to be careful with my indenting so this brace is matching with closing the for loop or excuse me closing the function loop and this brace is matching with closing this for loop but when you get several you know conditions in there and other for loops happening it can quickly get really confusing and that feature of the Arduino editor can be really helpful, a real lifesaver. Um, so, but we're good here. And so all we want to do is do a, uh, a, a analog write, a digital, a digital write. Let's just do a digital write for now. And what are we doing? Well, we're, gonna, we're going to turn on the pin. And so we write a high and we better delay for a while. Let's just delay for a second just to see what's going on and that's, that's enough let's just see what happens so the first one lights up the next one lights up this these are staying on I haven't turned them off they all light up in order and we can't really see because they're on they're still continuing let's turn them off after they light up so after we're done that delay we will just turn it off. I won't delay on, well, sure, we can delay on the off stage too. Not that much. So first one lights up, turns off, next one will light up. It's beating up a bit, there we go. Simulator has to warm up sometimes. And after this one, we'll turn off the next iteration of loop will run. So this for loop restarts back at zero and runs again. So we've got, you know, it's it might look like we didn't save that much code really, but when you think about it, the previous example for the for loop, I had only lit up the first, you know, two or three, and it really didn't get very far. So there was there was a bit more code and there was a lot more that had you know needed to be written still so let's take this idea one more step and I think we'll leave it at that for this video I think there's a lot that's just been covered especially if this is the first time you've seen a for loop or the first time you've seen it using how to use an array um, but I think one other thing that is let's think about trying to make it go this way all we really want to do is run this for loop in reverse. We want to start at index 5 and go down to index 0. And this is, you know, totally doable on our for loop. Let's just try it. We can start at index 5. That seems pretty straightforward. We definitely need a way to go down, which if we were to write it, uh, you know, in our code normally, we would think about it this way, I would think. And there is a similar operator to the oops to the plus plus, which is minus minus. So the same thing. This just says i equals i minus one. And we need a condition. So we really need i to be uh, greater than. You now, if you think about this, we want it to run for index values five, four, three. 2, 1, and 0. We want 0 to run. So if we were to keep the kind of idea here, we would make this a minus 1. Because 0, if we put a 0 here, we, your first inclination might be to put a 0 there. I don't know. But if you were to run this for uh, these values, let's just see what happens. It's going to take a while to get back down to the bottom. But you can think about it going down from 5 and when it comes down to one that will be still a successful condition here one is greater than zero but then when it de-increments that and checks the condition on the next iteration and watch here that one's on you know what <laughs> this works out actually quite nicely because it didn't 
it, it in fact did not run it for this value here because when it ran it for one, index one, it lit up this LED, did the code, came back up here, one became zero because it de-incremented it, and one is, sorry, it, one became zero, so zero is not greater than zero, so it did not run this code for the value zero. So really, if we wanted it to go all the way to zero, we should say minus one here, or we could see, say uh, greater than or equal to zero. But I might just leave it here because it turned out that actually ran just fine. And the reason was because it, because it stopped at one, it went back up here and started running this for loop. And of course, this for loop starts at zero. So this one's kicked in next. So that ran quite nicely. In fact, we might wonder what happened over on this end. This one should have appeared to be on twice as long because we ended at 5 and this loop, from this loop we ended at 5 and at this loop, index 5, we started at 5. On, on, off, on, off. So it lit up twice there. So we could in fact solve that problem by starting this LE, this one at sequence four. So this is kind of like a short, the reverse, the full forward sequence is going this way, and then the, f the reverse sequence is just doing this one down to this one. Might seem like an odd way to do it, but it will work. Right, so that was a lot. For loop and array, I think I'll stop it there, and uh, do try writing your own code. It's so important to sit down and try to write your own code and uh, look at that. A reference manual you know grab some code if you need to to get started but write as much code from that point forward as you can and uh, hopefully you'll get this working soon enough